It's the Benz Brunani woman is Baby boys, baby girls, you need to hear this Baby sit down, sit down, receive this realness Make sure your cup's ready for the tea we are go sip it here Hard time scrolling for your long shorts You might learn something you never know Could let you find And she's one of a kind Don't say you mind, say you mind me, I no go so far. I no go back for iron. Me, I no go so far. I no go back for scissors. God of miracles, now my papa. Why am I singing that? Why am I singing that? Because of the absolute shenanigans I've had while being in Lagos. But we'll get into that. You'll probably be like, who am I listening to? And it's me, Kelechi, in the place to be, and that place to be is Lagos, Nigeria, and you are listening slash watching SYM, officially known as Say Your Mind, unofficially known as What What, that's right, Suck Your Mum, and woo! It's been a time, it's been a time. So if you listened last week, I said I'd be in Nigeria because I'm speaking at Ake Festival, speaking about Edge of Here, and yeah, so Edge of Here is traveling the world, as am I. And I feel like I wanna do more of these things. I think that the next iteration of the show that I do, that will be hosted on my website, that will be more focused on, you know, exploring what the world has to offer and making, I guess, episodes from wherever I find myself and then we'll make with that what we will. So yeah, Ake Festival, has been brilliant. So I think it was in 2020 that I took part virtually. And then this year I was invited to come to Lagos to actually participate in person. And um, yeah, the festival has been great. I, you know, like you, ev like for me, I always start as a baby in whatever field I find myself in. So whether it was podcasting, whether it's opening a pole dance studio, whether it's acting like I'm always starting as a baby in something and then eventually I become a big girl. And currently I feel like very much a baby in the literary space. Like you're seeing all of these other authors and they're so known and people are like, oh my God. And it's wonderful to witness. It is beautiful. Um, after my talk, I think, you. so I was on a panel talking about um, speculative fiction with this author called Abu Bakr, uh, what's it, Abu Bakr Adam Ibrahim, that's his name. Um, he's written, his most recent um, book is called When We Were Fireflies and we're published by the same Nigerian publisher, Masobe. And I went to visit them actually um, before the festival started. I went to their offices to go and say hi. And that was such an affirming meeting to, because I feel like in UK publishing, people have you believe that you're a dickhead. Like th they have you believe that somehow you should just be, I don't know, there's an element of be grateful to be here and constantly you, you find that you gaslighting is taking place. I think I should do this before. No, you don't need to do that. And then the thing happens and you absolutely did need to do the thing that you said you should have done all along. So there's been all of that. And so I went to their offices to say hello. And um, the like founder of um, the publishers, it was lovely to meet him, Otuke. And we were talking and he said, do you understand that when I read your book, well, when the editors, the two editors, when they read your book, they were like 10 out of 10. Like in this kind of publishing house, those two together have never given one book 10 out of 10 together. There's one where she even, one editor struggles to give a book over six out of 10, but both of them agreed that Edge of Here was 10 out of 10. And it made my heart melt because it was just like, they understood. And then I was speaking for ages with the editors. They came into the room that we were in and I was speaking to them and they really understood Edge of Here. Like they were so passionate about it. And I feel like, that's what feels like it's missing in the UK space. Like, I feel like the people who have started reading the book are really passionate about it. But I feel like ultimately a few people around the book who are meant to be like uplifting it. Sometimes I wonder if they've even actually read the book. Like I genuinely wonder if they've read the book. 
because you don't hear the Jenny San Juan, you don't, you like, also known as Jenna Sequa, like you just don't hear it from them, like, oh my God, you know, and then when you, in this story, and in this story, in this story, to them, it's just another thing that needs to be out there. And my baby is too precious for you to just fling her out upon road and not support her while she's there. So it was great to like speak with them and have that experience. I just felt so ballsy and I'm looking forward to it, uh, the book coming out properly, like being published in Nigeria next year. So I think like spring next year, it will be coming out. And they've said that they're gonna lower the price also because they said currently it's out in um, Nigeria, um, a particular bookshop is selling it, but they're selling it at like 14,000 Naira. Now that might not seem a lot to you when you convert it, because 14,000 Naira is probably like the equivalent of 14 pounds. But if you think about the living wage in Nigeria, like that's absolutely ridiculous that somebody's gonna pay 14 pounds for a book. So they said that when theirs comes out, it's gonna be like 8,000 Naira, the equivalent of eight pounds, which makes, sense or no sorry i think they said six thousand six thousand naira six pounds which makes sense so while i was at um Ake festival after i did my talk lola shonayin who um is the founder of Ake festival she made an announcement because my book was priced at ten thousand um five hundred naira she made an announcement she was like um Kaleshi's book is now going to be um eight thousand for those who want to buy it and i thought I hope people know that I'm not the one that did this pricing because they must have thought, look at this critical girl and then she's come in and she's pricing her book anyhow. Like, honestly, I just felt like such small fry, but it is what it is. I know that now, if, if the editors feel this way about Edge of Here, I feel like the average reader will also kind of embrace what the stories are. I'm really looking forward really looking forward to that. And it's been great meeting all of these other people. It's been wonderful. Let me tell you what's not great. That's, let me tell you, because what is it called a shit sandwich? Let me now add the shit in the middle of that sandwich. Let if, if you have an enemy in this life and you want your enemy to suffer, tell them to go and stay at Bond Hotels in the Kedja. That is where you should go and tell them. My eyes saw my rascal ears. What? So, Initially, my battle with this hotel was that I wanted an iron. I needed to iron my clothes. They said, uh, ma, for us to give you the iron, you need to give us 10,000 naira. I said, what? They said, oh, we have to hold deposit for 10,000 naira. I said, okay. I don't have any cash right now because I've just arrived. And for some reason, my Nigerian ATM card is not letting me withdraw money, maybe because I come so like infrequently. So for some reason, I can't draw money from my card, but I can go into a bank branch or whatever. Yes, ma, but we need to take the 10,000 naira. Okay, so you, what you're telling me is that you want me to die. You, you must want me to die because why can I not have this iron for like, you can even come and stand by me while I use that. Can I just have the iron? Um, what we can suggest, ma, is that somebody comes and takes your clothes and irons it for you. How much will that be? 600 naira, ma. Okay, I'm now understanding that everybody hates me. So they take my first lot of clothes um, or one item, a t-shirt, they go and iron it. I They put the 600 naira on my bill. All right, cool. Eventually I get money because they give us like per diem, like an honorarium when you're here. So I got my um, envelope of my money. And so I go to them now and I'm like, here's your 10,000 naira. Can I have the iron? Yes, ma'am. Somebody will bring it to your room. Tell me, tell me why it ain't irons but a heart break. The iron arrived and the plug isn't compatible with the socket in the room. I said, okay, it's not what, I, I, at this point I no longer get it. It's just, it's okay, okay. No longer compatible, fine. Um, just making sure I've even switched this off, you know, because, you know, sometimes I'm talking to you all and you'll be like, your phone was ringing. And you know, my mum loves to call when I'm recording something. So as I was saying, um, yeah, the plug socket doesn't match. So then the, uh, one of the uh, people that work there, he came in and I, I swear on everything I love. He's now using something to chuck the top part of the socket so he can put the two prongs in at the bottom. I said, what? okay. Okay, this is what we're doing. That's fine. So I managed to iron one outfit. Eventually I gave the iron back because I just couldn't do it anymore. But my real dilemma began when I went back into my room and there were cockroaches on the floor. And don't get it twisted. I'm not saying this in terms of our oh, first world problems because you know, earlier this year I was in Peru 
um, in the middle of the Amazon jungle for the ayahuasca ceremonies. And you're when you're um, at the retreat that I went to, you're essentially you're just in a big tree house, and all that they've got is net um, to kind of cover the openings. So you're just in a massive tree house. That's it. So there were bugs around, right? I'm expecting that if I'm just bang in the middle of the jungle. But when I'm paying a particular amount and I'm walking into my room and I'm just seeing like cockroaches having a party, mm, I'm gonna have a problem with that. I'm definitely gonna have a problem with that. So I tell them like, oh, you know, there are cockroaches in my room. And then I was really fascinated by the fact that they got irritated with me. They're like, okay, ma, somebody will come and see to it. Okay, so I go out, go for dinner um, at Wakame, at uh, the Marriott go for dinner, come back. The, apparently people have seen to it, but the cockroaches are still having a wonderful time, still there. So I go downstairs and I'm like, this is taking a piss. Like there are still cockroaches there. I actually want to check out at this point. I no longer want to stay here. I can't suffer like this. I wasn't born suffering this way. Um, don't worry, ma, we'll rectify it. The manager comes out and he's like, don't worry, ma, we'll rectify it. So I think he went in and sprayed fleet, you know, to like a um, bug killer in the room but by that point i've seen them haven't i like I, we, I i see you you see me like we've seen each other so now i don't even want to sleep on the bed like even the throw that they put on the bed that's kind of like their signature i remember walking into the room with my mum because my mum dropped me off and it just looked dusty the curtains looked really really crusty like they hadn't been washed in like four years same with that throw but I said let me firm it because at the end of the day I'm coming here to do right by my book so it's not and I understand the also the financial constraints that an, that a festival like such as this would be facing because this year's festival wasn't even meant to happen Ake was meant to stop from last year so because again because of the financial implications and what it takes to do it but they were encouraged to you know do it again this year so i was trying to be cognizant of all of the factors that would mean that i'm partying with cockroaches in my room but it got i just couldn't i just couldn't and then it got to the morning i managed to i tried to sleep it was hard so it got to the morning and um i now need to cut my boob tape because I'm wearing a strapless dress. I don't know if you can see, but I'm wearing a strapless dress and I needed some to cut some of the boob tape to kind of lift up my tings. And I'm like, oh, can I have scissors? I asked them for 25 minutes. I kept calling downstairs to reception. I was like, can I have the scissors? Yes, ma, um, to have the scissors is 3000 Naira. You're making, no, 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 no. Now you're making things up because why do I need to pay 3000 Naira just to use the scissors? Okay, well, you, can, do you just need to use it quickly and you'll give it back? Yes, that's what I said. They bring the scissors up. One doof doof pair of scissors. Why do the scissors not cut their blunt? I said, you know what? That's fine. I feel like this is my cue to leave. I checked out and I moved myself to another hotel. The hotel I initially wanted to stay in, the hotel that I stay in, or I stayed in the last time when I was here. I just checked myself in because I said, I don't wanna be that person to them that's just complaining all of the time. And from what I can see, everybody else, all of the other guests, they're absolutely fine. So I don't know, Tani Moshe, like who have I offended that this is what I'm facing? First, no iron, and then the cockroaches want to, no. So to finish off that shit sandwich, I will say that the festival in and of itself wonderful that hotel if you hate somebody in this life book them that hotel that is all i'm suggesting the um caterer that um was catering for us as guests you know the speakers and stuff the caterer amazing my god food slaps all manners of food all man it's like they had the traditional um nigerian um you know sort of meals and it had other things like it was like a buffet the food was top notch, I'll give them that. Like they weren't lying, but, and those were external caterers. Cause I'm sure if they were caterers from the hotel, there'll be cockroaches in the chips. But in um, the actual kind of, the actual caterer that they bought, like brought in the external caterer, really, really good, really tasty food. In fact, I'm recording this with the mindset that I'll finish recording here I'm gonna go back. I wanna catch Dikwo for lying. I wanna catch his talk. He wrote, Africa is not a country. Um, he'll be speaking at four, I think. So he has the slot today that I had yesterday. So I wanna catch his talk. And I saw Bolu Babalola, I saw her talk 
um, first thing in the morning at 10 a.m talking about um, Honey and Spice, her book. And that was really, really cute. That was lovely. You know what I loved about that and what I aspire to? The way that the audience in Nigeria love down Bolu is actually so beautiful. Like they are in, they are certified lover girls. Like they love her books down. And that's what you want. You want people to love your stories as much as you love them even more in fact because the stories become theirs right so that was really beautiful to see so i want to catch dipos talk and so after dipos talk should ideally be some food um so let's see how that goes the person i was on a pa uh, panel with like i said abu Bakr, i think that nigeria sometimes this and this is just from a diasporic perspective i feel like nigeria is it just nigeria no i feel like let me say sometimes black women, they can be so male identified, so male centered, like everything is like, oh, I can't do that because will a man approve of it? Who cares? Half of them are not washing their bum. Who cares? But okay. So I'm on the panel with this guy. And if you see the way that the aunties, there was one auntie that was sitting in the front row. Her legs were just akimbo. Her legs were just open. Like, like, they were so infatuated with him. And I thought, okay, maybe it's because I haven't read his books. I, I, I know that he writes incredibly well. Just by speaking with him and the kind of tussles, the intellectual tussles that we've had, I know that he like writes incredibly well. And when I heard the premise of his um, stories from the, my publisher, my Nigerian publisher, he was basically saying how our books are clearly in conversation with each other. So if you consider one of my stories, The Watchers, where Ndidi and Chinonso, they meet in every lifetime or they meet in most lifetimes and they forget that they've met and they you know, fall in love again and again. Um, so looking at that aspect and apparently his story, um, when we were fireflies is about a man who um, reincarnates thrice, like three times. And he keeps going back like every 20 years and he's on a search to find this woman that he was in love with in his first life. And so I was talking to him about the fact that the publisher said that and that the, our publisher said that it's a love story. And he was like, I feel like when people say my, that story is a love story, they haven't read it properly because it's clearly a story about hate. Like it's hate that it's his, that's his motivation, not love. And he spun me because I'm here, you know, with my woo woo. Oh my God, did I remember my tarot cards? I think I did remember my tarot cards. So it was, oh God. Okay, so I still need to get in the tarot. I didn't put a tarot question in for this week. Oops. Um. So, well, you know me, I love my woo woo, but, like when he said that, I don't know, it got my back up a bit. Cause I was just like, what do you mean love is the motive? Like, isn't the motivation and it's hate. What are you talking about? But then when he explained it from his perspective, I was like, okay, I get it. And I'm not saying that he's, not, he's an attractive man, but the way that these women were behaving, I was like, is there more? And that's a really, sometimes that's an arrogant um, position to take because we were talking at a certain point and he said something and I giggled. And the kind of giggle that I did, I said, Kalechi, run, run, run quickly. Because I suddenly understood what the girlies were having to deal with. You, there is a kind of spellbinding charisma that certain people have. And if you don't keep your wits about you, ha! only danger can ensue from there. Like, I'm glad that I've given my life to God. So I am not in the trenches with the girls. I'm not. But it's very easy to stumble and fall into those trenches is what I'm saying. When you meet somebody, you know what? I think that what is so enthralling to the, um, to the girlies about him is that he knows how to write female characters. This is what I've been told, that he knows how to write female characters well. So in one of his um, first stories, it's a 50 year old woman um, that's the protagonist. And there's this love affair that she has with the guy, um, with a guy in his twenties. And they're like the way that he does the characterization of this 50 year old woman, as well as the sex scenes, like that apparently all, um, a lot of his um, stories are filled with sex, except for the most recent one. Meanwhile, my debut is filled with sex. So we were talking about that as well. We we're in conversation about that. But people love him because he writes women well. And I think you can only write women well if you see women, if you truly see women. A lot of men can't write women well because deep down they hate women. And so I read some things and I'm like, 
what who is this character because it's like you're writing an archetype of the women who have rejected you and even when they're writing sex scenes it's like who have you had sex with when you're talking about and she lifted her breast to her mouth and she was sucking it what kind of breasts does she have are they play-doh what happens like is she stretch breast strong like what 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 are you talking about it's it's odd it's odd is what I'm saying. So if you are a man trying to write female characters, it's important that you actually listen to women. They're more than just kind of side characters in your woeful life. And also that you like women. Don't write about women if you don't like them. And some people think just because they're attracted to women that by default, that means that they like them. No, there are a lot of men who are attracted to women and hate them. Okay, so do some digging, do some digging, do some introspection. Um, yeah, I feel like, was that everything I wanted to tell you? Yeah, it looks like, yeah, Aki Festival, met my Nigerian publishers, changed hotels, covered all of that. Do I want to still fill in tarot? Yes, and we are back. And I miraculously now have a table in front of me or to the side of me. And it means I can do this tarot reading. Well, I'm gonna do three tarot readings, I think. And I actually have to big up Clickcast Studios. I will, I told, <laughs> I told Annie there were no show notes, but clearly this is a show note. So it'll be added. So Clickcast Studios, that's where I'm using in Leki in Lagos, Nigeria. It is so cute in here. As you can see, you've got, um, well, you can't see if you're just listening on audio and the, okay, so audio comes out on Monday, as you know, Tuesday is when the visuals come out on YouTube at 5.55 p.m. London time. So I've got um, my logo behind me. It's a really cute space, it's soundproofed. Um, there's somebody to help you. And now I'm realizing that that's why I've been in the trenches in London because I'm doing everything for myself, running everything for myself in terms of filming and recording and stuff. And it just makes a difference having somebody here with you. And also the communication was so smooth. I was like, oh, do you have um, space for me to record on a Sunday? We're not open on a Sunday. Can I record on a Saturday? We've got a slot one, two, three, if you want it. It's affordable in terms of if you're coming from wherever we're coming from, right, to come and record here, it's affordable and they've just been absolutely lovely. Everything was running to time and that is wild for any place in Africa, let alone West Africa. Um, everything, it's just great. So if you're ever in Lagos and you need somewhere to record your podcast, I would suggest that you use here because I don't tend to recommend things of, unless I've tried it myself and I've paid my money to see the full service. So definitely check them out that that's c l i q c a s t click cast um look them up um in lagos so i feel like what we'll do for tarot this week because i haven't picked a letter um and almost probably forgot my tarot cards we're going to do a pick a par reading and so pick a par reading um i think that the subject for the pick a par reading should be what what's next mm. what's next in love for you so there's going to be part one part two and part three yeah what's next in love for you part one oh part one's already chosen itself part one part two or part three so let's see what we've got for part one i'm just going to take two more cards for part one and then I'm gonna pick three cards for pile two. Um, so you, while I'm picking out the cards, just think, really focus yourself, pile one, pile two, or pile three. What's next for you in Lurf? In Lurf and Wahala. Oh, I, I don't like the fact that every time I come to Lagos, I don't get to see Bob Risky. Like, it's wild. Anyway, pile one, pile two, pile three, let's go. And this is just a way for you to train your intuition. And those of you that like to shout, you God, God girlies, about, oh my God, tarot is so demonic. Get the fuck off my podcast. I keep telling you, every week you come back to listen and then you cry. Piss off. Um, part one, we've got the Knight of Wands that comes out first. The Knight of Wands, and then we've got, oh, nice. And then we've got Judgment. And then we've got the Nine of Wands in reverse. So what I'm getting for this in terms of what's next for you in love is that you're gonna have to 
make a decision. You know, if you want something in life, you're going to have to go for it with full force. And the and this can apply to love. This can, this can apply to your career. This I feel like I said, what's next for you in love? But I just think that ultimately, this is advice of for whatever it is that is next for you in the next stage of your life. I feel like that's what I would say. So. If you want something in life, you have to be able to go um, go for it. Some of you are playing dead in life, like you're playing dead. You're like, oh, and that's what the judgment card is giving me that, you know what, I'm just, I'm happy to deal with the status quo. I'm happy to have no passion in my life. Not even that you're happy, but it's like, I'm more comfortable having no passion in my life than taking the risk of feeling something and going for something full force, because it means that your barriers, your wa your walls have to come down. And so, and a lot of us, we prefer for our walls to be up because it means that, like, oh, nobody can get in. But if nobody can get in, that also means that you can't get out right so you've got to think what like what is the point why did you incarnate then why why did you incarnate if you were just going to use your whole life being scared like if you're not going to live life like what are you doing i'm not saying if you're not going to live li live life leave <laughs> that's not what i'm saying if you're not going to live life though then what is the point of this because some of you like let's be fair you're you're getting on in age you are and and yet here you are at this big big age still being scared what are you scared of and people often they're scared of heartbreak rejection disappointment but who die like are you did you die i'm not saying that it's not extremely painful to go through these things but you will make it through you will make it out of the other side and there comes a point where you're gonna have to wake up you're going to have to live life like actually actively participate in life. And sometimes people believe that they're participating in life because they're thriving in one particular area of their life. So for instance, if your career is absolutely, you know, doing what it needs to do, you're like, well, my career is going well, so it doesn't matter if like my personal life is going to shit. I ultimately believe that your career can't go as well as you think if your home life, what your kind of, your cocoon isn't as it should be. That's what I think anyway. So that's for part one. What's next for you is you're being asked because this is fire energy as well. You know, the night, it's only ones that come out here. It's a fire energy. Like you've got to, the passion has to begin. You've got to start feeling again. You've got to go for the things you want and let those walls come down um, because you can't enjoy life. You can't experience life from like the peripheries. You, you just can't. So pile two, let's get into you then. Oh, I love this. I love this. We've got the Queen of Wands in reverse. And then we've got the Ten of Pentacles in reverse. And we've got the Six of Cups upright. Whenever I see Six of Cups, it always makes me think of like soulmate energy, like, you know, um, somebody that's like your soulmate that you've known in um, life or there's like a, but also from this, I'm getting like a parental thing as well. So for those who chose pile two, maybe, and it's so wandy, like wands, wands, wands. For those who chose pile two, I feel like what's next is, um, is interesting. I said, I love this, but it is a little bit sad. I think that, changes are happening in some people's lives, right? Um, maybe with um, maternal figures or um, maybe you've become a mother or something like that, but there are changes happening. And then with the 10 of pentacles in reverse, it's not how you envisioned your life. So for some people, what I'm picking up from this card is also regret. Like, you know, like if things are changing and you're like, oh, I, you know, my life is changing or things around me are changing and I didn't get a chance to do this or I didn't get a chance to do this and they didn't get to see me do this. I get that energy from this card. But Queen of Wands in reverse, I think maybe some people are trying for babies and it hasn't quite worked out. So they're feeling a bit dejected. But it's just to remember that sometimes things take time. Nobody knows when the thing is gonna happen. You just keep going. And I know it can be, I, I say that and it sounds flippant, keep going as long as you think that you can. And also remember that there are other ways to be a parent if it's not the, you know, the actual route that you want to take. There are other routes also available. 
And to others, I'm queen of wands in reverse with 10 of pentacles. It kind of goes to what I was saying with par one in that you're not letting, if you have anger that you've suppressed in life, maybe even anger at a parental figure and you haven't allowed yourself to feel that anger. It's a follow on from, I think what I was saying last week, you haven't allowed yourself to feel that anger. The, the thing that you want, the kind of vision that you have for your life, it's never going to be fully fledged. It's never going to be full bodied because you haven't addressed your childhood wounding six of cups. You haven't addressed it. You haven't given to your inner child. So what keeps happening is that you see the thing that you want. You see whether it's a job, whether it's a person, you see the kind of person that you want and then you want to move towards them. But the wounding stops you. The sense of potential loss stops you from going, you know, all of the way. Um, it could be a job that you really want to go for, but you're not going for it because it's just like, oh, but what if I lose that job? Why, why are you already at the end of the story? Like, why are you playing God? You don't even know how things are going to turn out. So you either give it your all or, you know, you keep having, living this 60, 40% life that you're currently living. It's up to you. So that's what I get for pile two. Look at me being quick fire. Then I've got the emperor for pile three. Pile three, the emperor in reverse. Oh, the five of pentacles in reverse. Everything's so reverse. And the ace of cups in reverse. For, for, so from what I get from this, then what's next for some of you is walking away from a job, walking away from a situation. And maybe some of you are not talking to your father, but walking away from a situation, walking away from institutions and understanding that you won't be left out in the cold. Sometimes people stay in situations that they've long outgrown because they are scared that they won't have anything if they leave that particular situation. Even if we look at the people, because I was reading somewhere um, on my way here, I was reading something that said like, if you look at the people who have been fired from their jobs for being pro-Palestine, they have been people of color who have been fired. But let me tell you, all of those people will receive blessings in one way or another because they actually lived their fucking life. They actually did something. They actually stood up for something. They actually spoke up for something. So the, the blessing might not be immediately apparent because we've got the Ace of Cups here and you just see it. Whenever I see the Ace of Cups, I always think about Pom Pom and well, I'm not gonna go into it, but Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. Um, but that's out in reverse. And so the reason is that it might not be immediately um, clear what benefits there are for you if you walk away from certain dynamics that you're not even enjoying in the first place. Like you don't know what goodness is waiting for you if you're still holding on to things that aren't serving you. Do you really want to even work for your boss anymore? Do you even like, you don't even like your line manager. When you know that you've got to get up at 9 a.m. and go to work, you don't wanna go, you don't. You hate every second of it, but oh, your bills are paid. And again, I'm really careful about what I'm saying because it's not me trying to speak from a place of privilege um, because my heart was even shaking when I had to change hotels and pay for it. But what I'm saying is that I think the theme in all of the cards really is that cowardice is no longer, has never really served anybody, but for a long time, cowardice has been glamorized and people have always, have told themselves that, yeah, you know, it's fine for me to not speak out right now because one day I will, one day I will. When's that day coming? When? And so this is why I think it's interesting for me, even when people are like, oh, um, Kelechi's unhinged. Oh, she's so crazy. Oh, she's so loud and angry and all of these things. You can say all of that, but I'm not the one who's miserable. That's actually you. I'm not the one who's licking the ball bags of every institution and establishment um, wherever they are, especially in the UK. Like some of you get wet just thinking about, oh my God, this institution wants to work with me. That doesn't happen for me. It doesn't because I know that I'm a fucking big deal. Like I know that. I know that. I know it in my heart of hearts, even sometimes when I get down, because sometimes I do get down. And I think even being here um, at Ake Festival and all of that, there were moments where I felt a bit down and lonely. Um, Cause as you know, I don't really like large groups of people like being in large groups and I just felt like out of sorts, like personal stuff and professional stuff, all of that. Um, 
why am I saying that? I'm coming off my train of thought, but I'm gonna come back to what I was thinking about. When I was sat in the canteen um, at Ake Festival, right? I was speaking to an author and they were like, oh, I'm so excited for you. How are you loving it? Now your book's published. How does it feel? Your book's published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, if this is an honest conversation, then I'm disappointed. And having a book published has been the biggest anticlimax of my life. You know, when somebody's talking a big game and they're like, oh, when I see you, I'm gonna do this to you, I'm gonna do this to you. And then you get there and they don't have a clue what they're doing. That's what this experience has felt like for me. Like, it's just been an anticlimax. And I, and I can't hide that. I think that it's been apparent from the ways I've alluded to even this whole process. And the moment I said that, they went, oh my God, girl, me too. But you know, like the way that we're meant to speak about it and everything else. And I just thought, isn't that interesting that we're all walking around lying. And if you know one thing about me, God has never made a liar out of me. Lying is something I detest. I'd rather like you think um, of me a particular way, like, oh, she's so sensitive. She's so this, she's so that, but at least I didn't lie and everybody's putting up a performance, I'm not going to perform. If something doesn't sit well with me, if I don't like something, if I think something should be different, I'm going to say absolutely that. I'm not going to pretend that everything is okay. And it's funny because the moment I told my truth, they were actually able to go, oh yeah, girl, this whole process, what the fuck? And we need that. We need that in life, like for people to just be honest, even if you can't say things like, you know, blow by blow, um, like even if you can't say things because of um, legal implications, you know, somebody said to me the other day, they were talking about something about themselves and then they went, and this is why I'm nice to people because you never know when um, it's gonna come back for you and you know that whether there'll be opportunities there. And I don't know, I heard it. And maybe it was just me being sensitive, but I just thought it almost felt like um, a judgment on me. Like, oh, see, this is why I'm nice to people because you never know when rare, 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 as if I'm not nice to people. When actually for me, it's just like, well, the way that my life has worked is just like I say things as they need to be said. I don't go out to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't believe in brutal honesty, but as much as I can, I believe in radical honesty. I'm gonna say things when I need to say them. And if I know I absolutely cannot say anything in that moment, then I'm just gonna be quiet and I'm just gonna like remove myself. Like that's the easiest thing to do. But I don't necessarily believe that you go around being nice, nice, nice to everybody um, for one day they might come round and do something for you. I just believe in goodness and just being, you know, kind to everybody that I can be kind to in whichever moment, but I'm not gonna swallow my truth for the sake of niceness. I'm not a nice person. We've established this. I'm not a nice person, but I'm a kind person. And I think that there's a difference and there is a superficiality to niceness that doesn't sit well with me. So I have no real business doing all of that. But back to pile three, that was a really long way of me saying to you, don't be scared to walk away from whatever you need to walk away from in the next stage of your life. You will not be left out in the, um, in the cold. Uh, you'll not be left out in the cold. And there'll be blessings for you greater than you realize. Like some of you are meant to be doing your own thing, having your own business, doing like, but you're not currently. And yet, and you're getting frustrated working for people when your vision is way larger than theirs. And ultimately what I was gonna say earlier, somebody, uh, I'll talk about Nella Rose in a bit. I don't even think I remember to put it in the show notes, but I was speaking about what's happening to Nella Rose in I'm a Celebrity and somebody said to me, but who are you? Nobody. And I thought, who the fuck are you talking to? Me, I'm a somebody, right? And I know hands down, this is not even on an ego thing. I will go down in the history books. I will be one of the greatest of all time. I am already in fact, you know, and I have to stand in that truth that at every stage I'm willing to meet the universe where it's at. And I'm forever a student and a child of the universe, always willing to learn. And not everybody can stay, like not everybody can say that, like they're still living half lives, if that. They're living fractional lives. And I'm not about to do that. And so what I think what I was gonna say as well was that 
I think it leads on from what I said about Abu Bakr and the um, stories that he writes and people say that he writes female characters well and he wrote this protagonist that's in her 50s and she's getting her back blown out. All of those things, like, they love that. They absolutely love that. And I think that there is an importance to that, to truly seeing people. And what I was going to say was that Patrick Hutchinson, you know, the one that carried the racist on his shoulder during the Black Lives Matter marches, like... He's one of the first men, I'd say like cishet men, cishet black men that I've met, older black men as well, because for some reason, older black men, my God, they are so fascinated by me, so intrigued by me, but they absolutely are scared of me. Like, it goes without saying, oh my God, what will my dad think? <laughs> like, what would the institution think if I'm talking to her, if I'm seen in pictures with her? Like, get a grip. Those are the cowards I'm really talking about. Like, get a grip. Um, but Patrick Hutchinson was one of the first um, older black men that I've met who, he was like, I see from your videos, from everything that you do, I, I absolutely see you. Like, I see through the things, like I, I see what you're talking about, but I actually see you. And I think maybe the reason he's able to do that is because he's also a Libra son. I think he's the Libra son, Libra rising, but he's a Libra son. And so I, I think that he ch actually sees me. I think I get so frustrated and I think I've experienced it a little bit while even being out here. Somebody said to me, oh, Kelechi, of course we know who you are. All of us know who you are, Miss Superstar. Of course we know who you are. Um, and I, you, what did you say on stage that you're coming off social media? So we're gonna not see you anymore insulting people. And I thought, is that really what you took from everything that I fucking done? That I'm just out here insulting people. That's, that's all you gathered, that's all you got. And then I think about it in the, in the sense of men, when men speak to me, cis het men specifically, it's this whole thing of like, oh, um, people think you're so scary. Oh, you're a bit unhinged. And it's just like, but here you are miserable living fractional lives and I don't even believe that there's anything supremely different about me I feel like there are older black women who have the fire that I have um and maybe maybe show it differently I don't know but I, I sometimes think I sometimes think that there are generational things in place where people think that they can talk to me wreck or not respect my impact because like it's not, it's not the done thing. How I'm doing things is not the done thing. I'm not the crazy one. Like I actually see life the way that life is meant to be seen. You lot are the crazy ones because you're playing along with a stupid role play. And that tells you that these people in these institutions, you have to like lick their batty crease for you to get a morsel of what they have. Like what, do, like after you lot have collected all the awards that you want to collect in life, what then, what then? looking for validation from institutions, from validations that maybe you didn't get from family members, what then? But I'm not gonna have people like um, dangle their uh, potential validation over my head when I already know that I'm the baddest. Like, what? So I say that because if you needed that vim today, I hope that that provides you the vim. Like, walk away from anything that isn't serving you. 2024 is about bossing up in a major way, not even in a capitalist sense, but really stepping into your divine power, really stepping into your glory. And the next stage of your life is probably gonna need you to shed skin. We were talking about this last week, shed skin that you've outgrown. You're just gonna need to. And for some of us, like we said, for that divine feminine, for that, for that, for that energy to come through you, regardless of how you um, identify gender wise, for that energy to come through you, that you're going to have to look at some childhood um, woundings and address them. It gets so boring after a while, if at our ages, we're still talking about, oh, the way, the reason I behave this way is because this happened and this happened and this happened. And so what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? You're just gonna say that forever? Like, work it out, work it out. So anyway, I feel like that's the tarot for this week. You, Whichever pile you pe uh, picked, I hope that it resonated with you. Let's move on to Share Your Magnificence. For, for Share Your Magnificence this week, I saw a really interesting um, post um, or an article talking about the fact that 
um, research has been done into cures for sickle cell. And I just think that it's absolutely about time. It says here, Britain has authorized a gene therapy that aims to cure sickle cell disease and another type of inherited blood disorder for patients age 12 and over. Um, the country's medical regulator said on Thursday, becoming the first in the world to do so. So as much as I call Britain bad vibes, this is a major thing that we're actually looking into what can be done about sickle cell, especially when you think about the racialized aspect of who, um, you know, has to experience sickle cell. We can understand, well, we can see why funding isn't provided in order to explore it. So um, it says here, Kaskevi, Kaskevi is the first medicine to be licensed that uses the gene editing tool CRISPR, which won its inventors the Nobel Prize in 2020. Britain's Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, whatever they said this, sickle cell disease um, is a genetic condition caused by errors in the genes for hemoglobin, which is used by red blood cells to carry oxygen around the body. Both sickle cell disease and P. thalassemia, is that you medicine people are now gonna come for my neck, leave me alone, are painful lifelong conditions that in some cases can be fatal. Um, in clinical trials, Cascavi has been um, found to restore healthy hemoglobin production in the majority of participants with sickle cell disease and transfusion de uh, dependent. Um, is that psi? I said P, but I think it might be thi thalassemia, thalassemia? Anyway, you lot will correct me. But I collect, she pronounced it properly. Sorry, I didn't go to medical school with you lot. Re um, relieving the symptoms of the disease, um, which is amazing. The MHRA said no significant safety concerns were identified during the trials, adding that it was closely monitoring the safety of the medicine. The medicine is administered by taking stem cells out of a patient's bone marrow and editing a gene in the cells in a laboratory with the modified cells then infused back into the patient after conditioning treatment to prepare the bone marrow. Um, I love that. Why do I love that? Because we've been knowing the girlies, the astrological girlies, the sun, moon and the star girlies have been saying when Pluto enters into Aquarius, we're going to have massive monumental leaps in terms of um, science and how, and medicine, and th just things being safer for us. So I'm not surprised that this is coming out now, but I'm so, so grateful because I want for the people who um, have had to, you know, handle or deal with an experienced sickle cell to be able to live, you know, in the way that they want with, with without that pain. So, I really want them to get a move on with this. So yeah, I just thought two slaps on your chest. You lot that developed that, that invented that. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Hope you're not racist. Proud of you. Proud of you. Um, for So You Mad, what do I have? I was just reading more about Congo um, really. And I just think that, well, it's, I don't want to even say that it's interesting because it just make it kind of like, I, I don't know, it makes it sound diminutive what's happening. What's happening in Congo is absolutely massive. The fact that corporations for the longest time have just been killing and killing and killing in order to extract, you know, the metals that they want, the cobalt, whatever the case may be. They've been doing this for decades and getting away with it. It's, I'm glad that the people are now like, no, not even now, like they've been saying that this is wild. And it's not fair that when we think about the Congolese people, it's like, oh yeah, they can wind their waist, they can do this, they can do that. But what about their lives? Do we don't care about their lives? We have to care about that. And it says here, Congolese workers protested against their treatment by the foreign managers at the um, Psycho Mines Copper Cobalt Mine. Um, and the workers expelled the Minister of, um, of, of Employment and Social Welfare from the pr um, protest due to the government's complicity. And I think that that's super important as well because these companies wouldn't be able to do what they're doing in Congo if it wasn't for the fact that the governments are allowing it. Um, and that's a major thing. Somebody wrote here, Congo is rising, good for them. Um, it's their land, the foreigners need to get out. Pay attention colonizers, your time is up. You will no longer be able to pay puppets so you can destroy people's lives. The people will start to deal with the traitors. And 
I want to take a moment with that because you know, if you remember my video, chat shit get banged and how we're always told by those who are the oppressors that violence is not the answer, when violence is all they've used throughout history to get everything that they want. Like they've only ever used violence, but they're telling you the one that they're inflicting the violence upon, that oh, violence isn't the answer for you. You, what's best for you is complicity. Like what's best for you is to just go along with this and um, obedience. And if you look at some of the things that's required of you, in order for white supremacist structures to continue is the exact same things that preachers usually are preaching to you about obedience and this and that and you know give on to caesar what belongs to caesar who the fuck is caesar maybe caesar should fuck off to hell what about that so many aspects of the bible as it's purported and how as it's preached to us they keep asking you to be subservient and I don't believe that we're meant to be subservient. I actually believe that self-sovereignty, self-governance is paramount if we're going to have any success in this life. So big up yourself, Congo. And the more that I read, I'll be sharing with you all because I think it's necessary. Next up, let's go to somebody who was moving extremely mad this week, um, Cliff Richard. He was on, is it this morning? Is it this morning that it's the one with Alison Hammond? Yeah, anyway, let me turn up my volume on this so you can hear it. I'm gonna check, you can let me know if you can hear it too. I'm not talking to you, I'm talk to, talking to the wonderful person who's helping me. Um, let me see. This is what Cliff Richard had to say when they were interviewing him. Well, I love it. Did like you that. ever meet Elvis? Oh, no, I did not. I <laughs> had one chance through a, a, a journalist when I was promoting Devil Woman in the States. Yeah. He said, oh, I, I know Elvis, because he knew that I was influenced. And I said, he said, would you want to meet him? I said, yeah. At the end of the interview, though, I said, can we put it off? Because he was, he put on a lot of weight. Oh, right. And I thought, if I'm having a photograph taken with him and it's going to be hanging on my refrigerator, it, he's got to look good. And I put it off. And of course, then he died. Oh. Should so never put it off just because should, they're a little bit heavier. No. If anybody has got, if you're a fan of somebody's, you should, if you get the chance to meet them, Take it. meet them, even if yeah. they've put on weight. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you don't want me at your house, anyone? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so Cliff Richard. So imagine that. You're promoting your new book, your autobiography, whatever the hell it is. And he really thought he was imparting wisdom. Cliff Richard really thought he was imparting wisdom in that moment. Like, yeah, I mean, I could have met Elvis, but you know, he got fat and I just thought, nah. I don't, I don't want a picture with him if he's that size. And I, I can only imagine how uncomfortable Alison Hammond felt in that moment, hearing him tell that story. So essentially, are you saying that, for instance, if it was only Alison Hammond that was gonna be on that This Morning couch interviewing you, you would have turned it down because, oh, I don't wanna be seen next to somebody who might be, um, you know, bigger. Like, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Like, and this is why these things blow my mind. I don't know, ITV as a whole, girl, what is going on at that broadcaster? Like what is happening? Because we've got what's happening with Nella Rose on I'm a Celebrity, that's also ITV. And then we've got this on um, This Morning. And then I think they also do, do they, who does Good Morning Britain? I can't even remember, but no, it's actually wild. And what I find interesting about these situations is that I'm the person that some of these editors will turn around and be like, Kelechi Okafo, no, <laughs> while I'm working here, she's not coming on this show. She's not coming on this show. We don't know what she's gonna say. She's unpredictable. I've gone to, go in, uh, I've gone to BBC radio shows to talk about, you know, whatever the, you know, my book or whatever the fuck. And they'll be like, oh, we had to pre-record because we don't know what you're gonna say. To me, that's racialized and it's misogynoir because you're not doing that for some of these white people. You're not, especially these older white people, you're not vetting what they're gonna say. When um, Bernie Eccleston said that he'll take a bullet for Vladimir Putin, that was fine to go out on Good Morning Britain. That was broadcast. Cliff Richard can be here saying essentially, he can be fat phobic on here, saying that he didn't wanna take a picture with somebody that he was riffing off. Like you're riffing off what they're doing, but you're like, nah, actually you're too fat for me to stand next to, so I don't want the picture. Meanwhile, aren't that, wait, what's that? 
what's that? It feels like paedophile claims, paedophilia claims just hanging in the air. I don't know, but it's just floating in the air somewhere. But you can be out here saying whatever you want to say, but it's people like myself that gets vetted. And I'm the one that always has to show this sense of humility when people are giggling and saying, oh, cause you know, we were all scared when we were thinking about having you on the show. Do you ever, do some of you ever fucking sit down to ever think like when you're relaying these stories to me, what does it sound like to me? Oh, we were all in the chat. Like, should we have pre-recorded with collection? We don't know what she's going to say. Where did you get this from? Because if you look at all of the years I've been going on the news, when have I ever moved mad? And you don't sit down to think about it enough. You're talking about a real person. Like you're talking about a real fucking human person. But for some reason, it seems like you all can say whatever the fuck you want about me because I'm made of steel or stone apparently. So it's fine. What do you mean I'm going to say? Like, do you not think I know how this works? Do you think I would have lasted this long if I wasn't fucking smart? I'm smarter than all of you lot because for the past few years, you've been doing the same thing over and over and over. Look at my, look at my repertoire across how many industries and genre, look at that. But it's me that you wanna talk about. I've been told actually not to use the word denigrate because of what it means in Portuguese. Um, the etymological root of the word denigrate. I thought that it was fascinating. So thank you for telling me about that. But you can all speak and undermine what I'm doing. Some of you, not all of you. You can speak about what I'm doing. Like, oh, we, we should probably pre-record with Kelechi because you never know. But when have I stepped out of line? And the fact is, imagine, to me, it's the equivalent of Serena Williams all the time being asked to wee in a cup, being drug tested before most of her games when she was, before she retired, being drug tested for most of her games. But they're not doing the same with Maria Sharap over there. They're not doing the same with her, but Serena's constantly being tested. And I feel like I feel that in what I do, that I'm constantly having to prove my good behavior because everybody else is so threatened by the fact that I can actually speak truth to power and you're all fucking dying under your cowardice. Like, how is that my problem? Don't come to me ever again about, oh, you know, we've been wondering whether we need to pre-record because we never know, you're so unpredictable. No, I saved the source, I saved the juice for my channels. Why the hell do you think I'd bring it onto your channel? Be serious. There, uh, under like all of this stuff, there's business acumen. Cause you haven't sat down to even think to yourself, how have I had a podcast, um, not even just a podcast, a pole dance studio running for this long? Like, somehow, somehow, we're gonna have to give me my dues, but this is also why I know that I'm just done with this aspect of stuff, like just shutting down different things, um, whether it's friendships, whatever the case may be, um, professional partnerships, just shutting things down because what you'll never do with me any longer in this life is second guess. If you're having to second guess whether you should work with me, whether I should be a friend, whatever the case may be, you can fuck off to hell because to me, any smart person would absolutely realize that I'm the best bet that they're ever gonna get in this life. When um, there's a job that I'm currently, there's a job that I'm currently up for and my agent keeps telling me, oh, Kelechi, wait, 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 they're still making the decision, wait, wait, wait. I feel like my nose is so small in this lifetime because I will absolutely, in previous lifetimes, I'm sure I've cut off my nose despite my face many, many times. And that's why in this life, God was like, have a small nose because I'll cut it off despite, my, I will do it. I would do it. You have to be willing to like be ruthless in certain regards. Like I just can't take the ambivalence, the apathy that um, that is just prevalent in our society. And that leads me on to what I wanted to even say about Nella Rose. Like Nella Rose, I don't follow much of her work. I'll say that. And I also don't watch I'm a Celebrity. In fact, I don't tend to watch, I don't watch British reality TV shows. Every time people are like, oh my God, Love Island. I have no business there. I don't watch it. Oh, such and such. I think I gave up on British reality TV. Um, it must've been a season of Big Brother. I just deeped how horrible like Britain can be towards black women. And I just thought I don't want it. And specifically black women, because black men, oh, they love them. Okay, I'm gonna come off a tangent a bit and I'm gonna come back on tangent. I've also seen during this literature festival, the way, because there are some white publishers that I hear, white publishers, agents, press, they're all here. 
I see the way that they behave towards black men and how they behave towards black women. And it's so fascinating to me because I even experienced it in the UK, the, the, the treatment that black authors, illustrators, whatever the case may be, the black people that I know in the industry, the treatment that the men receive is so different from what the women receive. And why? Because why? Because there are so many, I would say, white people in the industry who subconsciously buy into the narrative of like, the attraction that they feel towards black masculinity. So they're willing to go the extra mile for a black man in a way that they would not for a black woman. And to me, that is evident even in this case. So when I think about the, um, when I think about reality TV shows, it's rare that you get a black man that's vilified, proper, proper vilified from being on a British reality TV show. Even when you think of what's his name? Ah, oh, he, 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 Brian, he was in Big Brother. And he said, oh, I, I, I prefer to go by Brian. I don't like it when they use my Nigerian name, Oluwole Bailo, Oluwole Bailo. I've never forgotten that. Um, he had some things going on, relaxed hair and the sorts. I hope he's okay wherever he is. But it's black women that have received the brunt of nastiness when they've gone on British reality TV shows. And I would know, if you remember when I went on to Special Forces Ultimate Hell Week, um, I went to South Africa to go and film it. And I ended up dropping out in season, th um, in episode three. Why? Because it was so rigged. It was so fucking rigged. It was frustrating. I've said this to you many times before. When it came to speed, when it came to running, when it came to doing all of those things, you weren't testing me. Like, I was doing all of the things. Then when it came time to choose groups, to choose teams, there were black men who were picking their teams that would not even pick me to be on their team. And at this point, we don't know each other like that because we've just aroused, um, we've just aroused, we've just arrived. So we can only base it on physical performance. And physically, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of the people here. Yet when, you, when it came time to picking a team, I was picked last. And that made me think about the way that sometimes black men operate within this industry. And heaven forbid you're even talking to some of these people romantically, like you can just see how far in the sunken place they are. They see you through the lens that the white institutions see you. So they're kind of sizing you up all of the time and working out the risk factor and all of these things. And it's just a sad state of affairs. It must be a really sad fucking life, I think. like nobody's brave they they're only as brave as the institutions allow them to be and that's sad but i'm watching him do this picking white girls before me that i'm literally blowing past them but it's like oh well this is where i want to be really fascinating and when i saw that in terms of being able to do well on this show i'm not going to be able to do well on this show if I don't have um, a strong team around me. So the best thing for me to do so I don't get injured anymore is to just leave. Um, meanwhile, one of the white girls, she made it into the finals. Why did she make it into the finals? Because she was sleeping with one of the producers. She was married at the time, which was really, really interesting to me. But she was sleeping with one of the producers. And so he would tell her that uh, roughly the time that we were about to get beasted, that they'd like 2 a.m., they'd wake you up out of your barracks, wake you up out of nowhere tell you to get your uniform on and then get you to the parade ground and they'll just be giving you exercises to do. It's all part of sleep deprivation. So they'll be doing all of that. Just before they would come to get us, she'd go, oh, I've hurt my, I can't even do it. I was gonna say which accent it is, but I'm not gonna say that. She'll be like, oh, I hurt myself. And then she would go to the medic's tent. And because she's gone to the medic's tent, that means that she didn't have to take part in the activity. So then now when we wake up in the morning and then, loads of us are tired and we're trying to get on with the activities for the day she's absolutely fine because she got the heads up about the time to go to the medics tent and what's worse is that even upon the all the advantages that were given to her she was still shit at literally every fucking exercise every fucking task that we were given she was still rubbish still rubbish yet she made it into the finals and that let me know there was one person, there was one woman who made it into the finals and I've never seen anybody like her. I've said this before, she's an, a machine. Like she is incredible. One of the most like physically impressive women I've ever come across in my life. And also in terms of her personality, 
the absolute loveliest and I always say that one thing about me I love when white people tell the truth and let me tell you she was a truth teller because when Reggie Yates came up to her I guess on, on um, under the instructions of the producers because he was the presenter for that um, series he came up to her and he was like oh let's talk about how well you're doing you're absolutely you know you know doing so well at all of these challenges she stopped him and she was just like thanks Reggie but I want to take a moment to say that I find it really frustrating how Kelechi's been treated. Kelechi's hands down one of the strongest people in this competition, yet people keep saying st stuff like, oh, she's weak, she's weak, she's absolutely not. And I just don't know why we're saying that. Of course, they didn't use that in the edits. She said it in, the, in front of everybody in the canteen with the microphone in front of her and the camera in front of her. She said it. And of course, it didn't make it onto the show because that would have broken up the lie that they've created a narrative for me. I don't know what story arc they were trying to take me on, but you're absolutely not gonna take me on a story arc of the fact that I'm not physically strong because I will absolutely break everybody's neck here. Are you nuts? So I really appreciate her, Sarah, her name is Sarah Thompson. I appreciate her up until this day because to me that was allyship that was somebody saying I don't agree with what's happening here and I'm not going to be complicit in the lie that even black men are joining in on so there's that and I feel like a lot of people are joining in on a lie generally which is why I find a whole pre-recording oh my god collect you so scary oh my god collect you so unhinged I find it really fucking stupid I think you're all fucking stupid really stupid and you're all cowards ridiculous um, so when I'm looking at what's happening with Nella, you have to be aware that they're editing this. They're editing Nella Rose in a particular way. This is a 26 year old girl who both of her parents have died. She was homeless for, um, for a time and somehow she managed to make YouTube videos that shot her, catapulted her into fame. She doesn't necessarily have all of the learnings that somebody might require to be in the media, especially mainstream media, and be um, subject to the voyeuristic, you know, lustings of the British public. She, in other words, she's not media trained. And I enjoy that. I love people who aren't media trained because they tend to tell the truth, but also there are legal implications. But, um, so she's on this show and then what's his name? Fred, the French guy who's um, with a black woman. He said something to her during some kind of whatever they're talking about. And he said, I'm old enough to be your father. That's triggered her. And that reminds me of pile two in the tarot deck that I'm speaking about. That unless we deal with the childhood or we deal with the woundings that we carry, there will be triggers that just, you know, like set us off. So he said that and that's really upset her because her father is no longer alive. Now, we can go both ways on whether her reaction was a particular way and whatever the case may be. But I do, from what I understand, he kept pushing it. He kept pushing that conversation and she didn't appreciate it. Then I think things settle down and then he's made some food in the jungle and I think he's offered her some and she says, I'm not having any, um, your, any of your food because we're still beefing. Now, those of us who understand that colloquialism, we understand that if the vex, if I'm, if the vex is still vexing me, I might not want anything from you for a bit, but I don't think it was meant in a, like a begrudging way. I don't know. Then she gets into a conversation with Nigel Farage and I could, I think I can grasp what she was trying to articulate, but the way that the British public, the British media have set upon this girl it's so disgusting to me. And the thing is, it's not new. They did the same thing with Alexandra Burke. And then I think her PR company must have told her, oh, d say that you don't think it's racism. And I remember talking about that in a previous episode. Like, how is it that when people come to support some of you lot, and because we see the misogynoir, you listen to your white management with them telling you to deny it and therefore you're denying us. Do you think we're gonna ride out for you again? Cause I'm not. I'm not, next time I'll stay quiet before you now come and say, oh, I don't agree, I don't agree. You know, Omar, stay there, it's fine. It's not by force. And so when I'm looking at Nella, um, Nella how Yewande was treated, how Trish, I think it was Trish that's in, that was in the Big Brother house recently, how she's been treated, there is a pattern. Britain does not like black women. Britain does not like black women, especially um, 
on reality TV shows. They just don't. And the thing is, I can accept Britain not liking black women when they go on these reality TV shows, but it's just all white Brits not liking them. But when it's other black people going, oh, I kind of see their point. I'm like, are you all right? Do you not know that when we've got company, you should st like what our party line is while um, Nella, while Nella Rose might need to, um, how should we say it? While Nella Rose might have said some things that the mainstream public do not really understand, we have known her on social media to be so funny, effervescent and lovely. That's our party line. We don't deviate from that. But all of you now wanting to run critique that she's this and she's, who asked you? Why is it only when it comes to black women that suddenly you know how to logically, you know, I want to add logic and I want to add this and I want to piss off. So Nella, you'll probably not see this, but I hope you come out and you come out to lots of support and lots of love. Um, I feel like career wise, you'll be absolutely fine, but your mental health is paramount. And I'm so sorry that that's, I wouldn't say this raggedy country, but I'm actually currently in Nigeria, but Britain, that raggedy country, is treating you the way that they're treating you. Um, time and time again, we're reminded that there are racists everywhere. So I hope that you know that you're loved because you're not the issue. Um, the British psyche, the depraved psyche, that's the issue. Anyway, next on So You Mad, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. A third accuser sues Sean Diddy Combs for sexual assault. Jane Doe plaintiff alleges Combs um, and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall took turns in raping her and a friend after an event at Uptown Records in the early 1990s. Now, my thing is, there are woeful, pitiful men who will read that and go, see, this is why he never should have said, this is why he never should have settled out of court with, with Cassie, because now all of these other gold diggers they're gonna come around and they're gonna be looking for some money. Shut up. Or did you consider that he, this abuse, this abusive rape culture is so rife within the entertainment industry that other people who have experienced harm at the hands of um, Diddy, they're also now feeling the courage to speak up. Everybody drain his bank account, drain his bank account. If he did what he did to you, drain his bank account because it's the only way. It's the only way and people are getting shook. A lot of the men in the industry are getting shook because what was normalized as part of the culture to abuse women is now coming back to haunt them. Now, some of them are broke. So there isn't much that one can do there truly, but those who have money drain their bank account. Absolutely so, simple. Um, from what it says here, the new lawsuit against Diddy seeks money for the substantial and lifetime injuries resulting from being drugged, sexually assaulted and abused and being the victim of revenge porn that Sean Coombs or P. Diddy created and distributed. So, um, it's going to, 2024 is going to be a long year for Puff Daddy. Woo! P. Diddy, whatever he wants to call himself, it's gonna be a long year for him. I mean, while Pluto's in Aquarius, I think that all of it is just gonna be very, very long. Um, and everybody also, you need to remember that they need to move quickly with making, um, with putting their claims forward because under New York's Adult Survivors Act, um, they, there's only a one year look back that's allowed. And so historical cases, you're gonna find that probably more historical cases are coming out now because time's running out basically for you to seek um, justice for things that happened, you know, many, many years ago. So Diddy, I feel for you in terms of, um, you're gonna get that ass beat, like you're gonna get dealt with and it's absolutely what you need. And my heart goes out to all of the women, all of the people, cause I don't think it's just women, who have um, experienced harm from this particular person. So that's that for So You Mad. Let's go to Suck Your Mum. Well, okay, well, straw of the week, okay, is Suck Your Mum. Look at me just moving things around. So my straw of the week goes out to a gentleman. Is he a gentleman? No, he isn't, he's a pussy clerk. Known as Ben Anderson. Now, some of you don't remember who Ben Anderson is, but don't worry, I'll remind you. If you cast your mind back to, I don't know, was it 2021? 
I want to say 2021, I could be wrong. I think it was 2021. Um, Channel 4 did a whole thing where for Black History Month, we had Black to Front, which was 24 hours of just black programming from the commercials to the shows that were shown. Everything was just blackety black, black. So I remember seeing this advertised and tweeting about the fact that it's so interesting to me that as somebody who's greatly contributed to black British culture, especially in London, that this day would be taking place and I wouldn't be involved in some kind of way. Lo and behold, the ashy people got mad and they were like, oh, what do you mean? It's cause your bad vibes and unlikable. That's why they didn't ask you and da 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 da. Meanwhile, rest in peace, Jamal Edwards. I didn't realize that a project that Jamal Edwards was wor working on at the time that I was approached for was actually gonna be part of the slate for Black to Front. But I was going to the Dutch, uh, the Dutch Grand Prix that year. Yeah, it was definitely 2021 because that's when all the fucking shit with Abu Dhabi Grand Prix happened. And I'm, oh, ha, I'm so glad. The last race of the season is tomorrow. Abu Dhabi Grand Prix is tomorrow. I can't wait for the season to be over. I don't, there is no three time world champion that's called Max Verstappen. There really isn't. It's factually inaccurate. It's actually inaccurate. So I won't be joining you in that. Okay. And Toto Wolf, I don't know if you'll see heaven. I like, I, I don't know if you'll see heaven. For the kind of cars that we've had to deal with since 2021, I just don't know if you're going to see heaven. If we enter 2024, the 24, uh, 20, the 2024 F1 season, and you give us a W, what is it now? We're going to have the W, whatever, 15. I don't want any more. I don't want. I don't know how Hamilton managed to sign on for two more years. Because me, I would fight you. I would lock you in a toilet and we'd fight. Because I don't get it. But... Anyway, back to what I was saying, 2021, Black to Front is happening. I was going to the Dutch Grand Prix, so I couldn't film with them for this project. And then I re later realized that it was for that. Jamal Edwards was in my DMs and he was just like, oh, I still really, really want to work with you. He was just so lovely, you know? Um, so I was tweeting about the fact that I wasn't involved and then people started saying what they were saying. And I remember Ben Anderson being somebody that tweeted at me and he was just like, well, why do you think you're going to get a seat at this at the table with this bad attitude and rah, rah, rah and rah, rah, rah. And I'm sure that there are black men who were black people generally who were really supporting his statement that I have a bad attitude. I have a bad attitude. Okay, that's debatable. That's debatable. But I feel like what you're calling a bad attitude is that I don't hold any sort of reverence for institutions and I'll say what I want to say. It's really that simple. But okay, go off. So he said, that's why you don't have a seat at the table. And I was like, first of all, where the fuck did you come from? And who the fuck are you? And why are you speaking to me? But apparently because he used to throw these mansion parties that everybody wanted to go to, he was really that guy. And although I have to pick up Ramel London amongst other people who were like, no, Colette, she's right. She, abs she absolutely should have been part of it. Even Diane Abbott quote tweeted me and got Diane Abbott said, I'm that girl. So I want to know where some of you get off, especially some of you that work at broadcasters and whatever the hell you do. Where do you get off saying that you need to do this? You need to pre-record with me. You need to do this. Or, you know, we don't want to anger Kalechi because she's going to cuss us out and she's going to do this and she's going to do that and the other. When I'm just saying what needs to be said, where do you get off doing that when a whole Diane Abbott, the first black female MP, could turn around and say, Kalechi's that girl. Where do, where do you think you get off? Because at the same time, I don't necessarily need validation from other humans. Like I'm validated by the most high, but I need you to think about that. That you, you are all in your little echo chambers where jealousy is doing you. Jealousy is doing you because you know that on your best day, you can't do what I'm doing. You don't have the courage to do it. You don't. And so in order to convince yourself that the path that you've chosen is the correct one, you'll make it out like, oh, but Kalechi's just crazy. No, you're the crazy ones because you seem to believe that uh, you'll keep doing good behavior and good behavior and good behavior and the master will keep giving you things and rewarding you. That's a sad little life. So because they wanted to go to Ben Anderson's parties, he had some um, organization called Musicalize. They wanted to be seen with him and whatever else, um, hang out with him, 
his wife, I think she's a yeah white woman, and they have six kids. I don't know if they had six at the time. Um, doing all of this stuff, so people just kind of watched that whole interaction as he was extremely rude to me for no, I dragged him to hell. Don't ever get it twisted. I dragged him, I tore him a new asshole. But the fact of the matter is who the fuck are you talking to? So imagine my surprise, quel surprise. Imagine my surprise when I see a daily fail article. Now on any other day, you know that we're not fucking with the daily mail. You know that, but I read here, Social media influencer defrauded investors out of eight million pounds by pretending to promote concerts by Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Eminem and Beyonce, the court has been told. A social media influencer who appeared on Good Morning Britain, isn't that funny? A fraudster can make it onto Good Morning Britain, but me, the one that tells the, the truth about social inequity um, in Britain, I don't go on. Bernie Eccleston can say he'll take a bullet for Putin. He goes on Good Morning Britain. At this point, I don't want to, I, I didn't ever want to go on the show, FYI. I just really want to be clear on that. But I want to show you how in real time, people will make it out like I'm the issue, yet they'll get bottom of the barrel pieces of shit to come on the news or come onto these shows instead. But I'm the problem. Can you see the insanity of the world that we're living in? Anyway, a social media influencer who appeared on Good Morning Britain is accused of defrauding investors out of millions of pounds by pretending to promote concerts by Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Eminem and Beyonce. Ben Anderson and his wife, Sophie. Funnily enough, there isn't a single picture of his white wife, Sophie. There isn't a single picture of her, but apparently they were colluding together. They were doing up Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. They were colluding together, but nowhere do you see her picture. And I want some of you to remember that. Remember that. Ah, ben Anderson and his wife, Sophie, are alleged to have stolen eight million pounds from investors through their business, Musicalize, to, lie, uh, to live the high life of luxury accommodation and first class fl um, flights to holiday destinations, including Dubai. The couple are accused of falsely claiming they could promote high-end performances by the US musicians at venues across Britain and had demanded huge fees from their clients, Lowry Trading Limited and SAS Financing Limited to do so. But in fact, they did not promote a single one of the concerts and produced false invoices and bank statements to pretend they were attempting to do so. London Circuit Commercial Court heard. Jonathan Cohen KC for the claimants told the court, this is a case of theft by Mr. and Mrs. Anderson of eight million pounds. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson are fraudsters. And here I'd like to let you know that there is a picture of Ben with his bald head and with two dogs on his lap, really thinking that he's transcended blackness. Ah, but no picture of Sophie. Anyway, they have cheated the claimants out of many millions of pounds by the pretense of seeking funding to promote concerts at which famous musicians would perform. There were no such concerts organised, no attempt to organise them and no prospect of those concerts ever happening. Beyonce? Beyonce? You were going to get Beyonce for how much? How much? Mr. and Mrs. Anderson simply spent the money on high living. A close study of their bank statement reveals that almost none of the money was spent on business purposes. It was spent on high living. The couple said they needed 28,000 pounds per month. To be fair, I too need 28,000 pounds per month. <laughs> oh God, I see what you are doing for others, but I don't want it in a fraudulent way is what I'm saying. I don't want it in a fraudulent way. I don't want money ritual, please. That's all I'm saying. But 28,000 pounds a month, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sniffing at the amount. It's how it was got. Okay. Um, the couple said they needed 28,000 pounds per month. This was to cover the costs of two nannies and a huge rented house. That really is so interesting to me because the house is rented, but my mum was saying to me, and don't ask me why my mum knows this. My mum was like, well, of course they'd rent the house because if they bought it, it could be repossessed. Like in this case, they could take the house back from them. Whereas renting, they're fine. 
So I thought that was interesting. But wouldn't you just build a house on another island that they don't have jurisdiction over? I don't know. Um, it was spent on first class flights for holidays to places such as Dubai. The court heard how the Andersons attempted to deceive their clients with a series of forged and fabricated documents, including forged bank statements, forged invoices and reports purporting to show ticket sales. Mr. Cohen Casey told his honor, Judge, Judge Richard Pierce, they claimed they were producers of high end performances, but they did not promote a single one of those concerts. There is not one bit of evidence to suggest that these people of no moment in the music industry could have um, had the slightest chance of organizing concerts with major celebrity performers um, intended to do so or took any steps towards doing so. There was no prospect of the Andersons being able to put on concerts as persons as well known with persons as well known as Dr. Dre. Um, Instead, in a scheme to extract more and more money from the claimants, the Andersons produced reams of forged and fabricated documents, including forged bank statements, forged invoices, and reports showing ticket sales for concerts, uh, concerts that the claimants believed they had invested in, which, uh, which ticket sales were wholly false, given that there were no such concerts. Mr. Cohen KC told the court that the Andersons had refused to accept any wrongdoing and continue to live the high life as social media personalities. He concluded, they continue to live a high end life as social media personalities. It is high time that this was brought to an end. The defendants are common garden grifters or common or garden grifters. The Andersons later told their clients that the concerts to be heard between 2020 and 2021 had been cancelled due to COVID lockdowns and therefore would be scheduled to sometime in the future. The couple also suffered the tragic loss of their twin babies. My apologies, my um, sympathies for that. During this period, the court heard. Their defence submitted to the court stated that Anderson's position in short is that they originally intended to organise the concert and um, so were not fraudsters from the outset, but matters snowballed. I'm going to read that again because it's the most fascinating thing I've ever heard. The Anderson's position, in short, is that they originally intended to organise the concerts and so were not fraudsters from the outset, but the matters snowballed. So it's the, 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 the spirit of fraud, the spirit of yahoo, 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 it entered them after the fact. After they saw that they got away with it, they were like, wait, we didn't have to put on the concert because of COVID. So we could just not put on concerts and keep getting money from people. Wow, wow. And 2021 is actually when he was insulting me. You see what happens? Um, Seward Atkins KC for the defendants told the court, Mr. and Mrs. Anderson asserted that they are well known in the music industry and disputed the allegation that they were not in a position to organize concerts for such well-known pop stars. Seward Atkins KC, how do you plan to get paid from this? Because I hope you know that they'll have no more money and they're not gonna win this case. He added that the couple had every intention of repaying all of the debts that they had incurred from their clients, but for the collapse in business due to pandemic lockdowns and the tragic death of their twin babies. Mr. Atkins Casey told um, his honor, Judge Richard Pierce, the concerts may, have, uh, may well have taken place had it not been for the pandemic and the extraordinary personal tragedy, the death of their twin babies. Ben Anderson, who has nearly 40,000 followers on Instagram, caused outrage earlier this year on Good Morning Britain when he promoted the TikTok prank shown, um, known as the egg challenge, which sees parents cracking eggs on their children's head um, as a lighthearted joke. Viewers disagreed with 39-year-old Anderson, who documents his life in which he spends much of his time folding laundry and doting on his six children on his Diary of a Dad Instagram account. Some took to Twitter to share their distaste at what they argued was abuse. Members of the audience agreed with GMB panelist um, Ola, our babe, um, a mother of four, who likened the challenge to a form of bullying. The prank had taken TikTok by storm over the summer with footage shared online showing toddlers left confused, in pain, or bursting out in tears after parents cr carried out the egg crack challenge on them. Some critics slammed parents for copying the prank for exploiting children to gain social media engagement. I mean, I don't want to speak from a self-righteous perspective because at the end of the day, I don't post Lev on social media for various reasons. 
But um, there are people that I see and I do think it's exploitative how they use their children on social media. But you can see that like Ben is a little fucker because there are so many of these, not necessarily just dad type Instagram accounts, but there are so many of these people who um, posit themselves as like, look at my life as a this and as a that. And they're the worst people. They're the absolute worst people. People will call themselves, I'm a dad this, I'm a dad that. And they're pretty much starting cults. Like I, I, I don't wanna get into it. I don't wanna say too much because then if I speak, people will say that I'm speaking. But Ben, I'm sorry for what happened with your babies. So I'm gonna respectfully put that to the side and just think about this court case as a whole. When you do clownery, the clown eventually comes back to bite. Stop speaking on people and stop speaking to black women in such a reckless way. Stop. Because while you were speaking to me in a reckless way, you were spending people's money anyhow. Why did you need to go on first class flights to Dubai with other people's money, doing up high life and people were coming to have parties with you, but you see those same people that were partying with you, where are they now? They don't wanna be seen with you now because you're a thief. You are a thief. And look at where it led you. You were trying to ingratiate, ingratiate yourself to white supremacy and your white family, your white wife, all of that by insulting me. But you see how now when they're speaking on the fact that you are a thief, they're not using a picture of Ice Queen Snow of Sophie. They're not using a picture of Snowfee. They're not. All the pictures are of little black bald headed you. Look at that. None of you will ever transcend blackness because it's not possible. All right. And don't ever speak on me again because my ancestors will slap that shiny head of yours. Yeah, keep my name out of your mouth because my ancestors don't sleep. And this is a message to all of you cunts. You might think that you're getting the laugh today, but my ancestors will always absolutely have the last laugh. Behave yourselves. And that's that for this week's episode. I, I'm, it's a miracle that I managed to get it recorded. Um, not a miracle because Clickcast Studios, they're wonderful. Like I said to you already, check them out if you're ever in Lagos. Um, it's been a joy to pay for this service. It's been a great service. And that's me. You can find me on, for a short time, at Kolechnikov or at Say Your Mind Pod. Um, tarot readings, you know where to find the tarot readings on my web, um, my website, kolechnikov.com forward slash shop. Um, or if you want to join Patreon, patreon.com forward slash kolechnikov. But I wouldn't really recommend you join Patreon because we're all going to be migrating to my website from the end of January. I'm very excited to tell you about the live show. Once we've um, kind of um, crossed our T's and dotted our I's, I'll be telling you about that. I also, I think I mentioned having a photo shoot with Severine um, last week. I finally saw the po um, photos and Severine is extremely rude. I favorited 65 photos and I needed to choose from those 65, only a few, 65 photos. I've never ha favorited 65 photos of myself ever before. So I'm so excited to see the final edited images. Um, and I think that's it. I feel like I've said enough. I'm tired. You know, this has been an experience. I'm tired, but hey, you got an episode, right? You got an episode. So that's it. I have been Kaleshi Okafor and this has been SYM, officially known as Say Your Mind, unofficially known as What What? That's right, suck your mum. Anyway, I'll catch you on the flip side. Peace. It's the Ben's Brunani woman is Baby boys, baby girls, you need to hear this Every sit down, sit down, receive this realness Make sure your cup's ready for the tea we are go sippy here oh, Hard time scrolling for your long shorts oh, You might learn something you oh, never know oh, oh, oh. let you find And she's one of a kind Don't say you mind, say you mind